when the first national mark of the beast law <clears throat> is passed. These are man-made laws that are contrary to God's eternal law. When those are passed and made a law, then the tables of stone containing God's law will be put on public display. Your archaeologist believes he's found the ruins of Noah's Ark. I would stake my life on the fact that I know where the Ark of the Covenant is. But he has hidden physical evidence of all the major events in the Bible, under the waters of the sea, in caves, and under the ground, and preserved them until this time. You know, people are pack rats. When I come home, I have pockets full, and sometimes I have more than that. If the whereabouts of these things have been known, you know, for the last two or three thousand years, there wouldn't have been anything much left for you and I to see. So knowing that, God just simply hid them from uh, our sight and allowed people to visit traditional sites. These kept the story alive and of course, it preserved the real sites and the objects there. Now, the Bible tells us that Satan deceived a third of the angels. Adam was created a little lower than the angels. Satan deceived him. You and I have been deteriorating for almost 6,000 years. We've been bombarded by cosmic radiation. Our ancestors drank too much, used opium, and you know, just one thing and another. And today it's said accurately that we use less than 10% of our brain. What that amounts to is that Satan can deceive us anytime he wants to. Our only protection against that is the Spirit of God. If we invite the Spirit of God to dwell in us, then he will help us discern between what's good and what's evil. Now, all of us have heard people make a statement, you know, that Satan can deceive other people, but he can deceive me. Well, bless their hearts, he's already done it, thrown them in the bottom of his catch bag and is out looking for more challenging game. So, since Satan was not allowed to destroy all these evidences, what he has done, he has raised up people to say that they have seen Noah's Ark. 31 different people saw it in 31 different places. One of these places, by the way, is in the state of Pennsylvania. Okay. Now, they can prove to you that it's Noah's Ark because it has all these animal bones in it. Well, you know, I think that if they had died on Noah's Ark, we wouldn't have any now. But all of the lies are not that easy to see through. And there are stories about where the Ark of the Covenant is, and many, many things that Satan has got people to say to lessen the impact of what God is showing us. You see, if he can't keep us from seeing it, he wants to muddy the water and lessen the impact and the credibility. 
So anyway, tonight you're going to see the remains of Noah's Ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Red Sea crossing site, and the real Mount Sinai. And then we'll take just a short break and you'll see the grain storage pits that Joseph saved the grain in for the famine. You'll see how the pyramids were built, okay? And the reason we show that is because Joseph built the first pyramid in Egypt, right? Then you'll get to see Moses, a statue of Moses. And then you'll get to see a little bit of work out in the uh, area of Kadesh Barnea. Now, we'll just show you the turning over of one stone. Most people lose interest if you show them 48, where you didn't find anything. So we just edited all of that out and went right to the one where there was something there. And then after that, you'll get to see the most precious thing that God has preserved and is revealing to us here in these last days. So if whoever is uh, managing the video will fire it up, Christ will one day ask the question, what more could I have done in my vineyard that I have not done? And the answer is going to have to be that he could not have done any more. So I would like to share with you uh, in Isaiah 26, 19, the Bible says, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Then it says, Arise and sing, ye that sleep in the dust, for your dew shall be as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out her dead. Now the fulfillment of that is recorded in Matthew 27, verses 50 through 53. It says, When he had cried again, he died. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. The earth shook, and the rocks were rent, and the graves were opened. Exactly that way uh, in the New Testament. Now, in Psalm 77, 13, it says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest offered two animals. First of all, he offered a bullock for his sins and those of his family. And he took this blood into the most holy place and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. And this figuratively cleansed him. And then he went out and they cast lots on the two goats and the one that represented Christ as the sin bearer was killed. And then the high priest carried this into the most holy place and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. Now some of you here remember this uh, description of the garment that the high priest wore. Around the border at the bottom, it had some bells. Now there was a reason for this. And when he went into the most holy place, there was a cord tied around his ankle. If, when he went in there to offer these blood sacrifices on the mercy seat, if everything was not in order, if he hadn't made everything right uh, with his neighbors and all this, then he was struck dead before the Lord. And they had to pull him out, his body out of there by that cord. And the way they knew when that happened was if the bells didn't keep jingling as he walked about his work in there, if they quit, then they knew that he had died. So the point of this is Christ as the true high priest if his sacrifice had not been acceptable to God, he would not have come out of the tomb. Okay? And neither would any of the saints that were asleep. None of them would have been resurrected. The moment Christ's blood touched the mercy seat, all those people that had died in faith under the blood sacrifice system 
participating as Moses directed, they were bought with a price. The old covenant was ratified and the new one was ratified so that you and I can go to the Father in the name and blood of his Son and ask for forgiveness and for rehabilitation so that we come to reflect the character of God. You know, the Bible says, now are we the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be, but when we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Folks, if you and I want to be acceptable to God at the end of all this, when his son comes, we must cooperate with him in changing our characters, our motivation, our actions, so that we perfectly reflect the image of God. There are those that would like you to believe that you can give your heart to the Lord, and then the rest of your body is yours to do whatever you want to with. That is not the case. Uh, everyone that sinned, and the Bible says all have sinned, is under a death penalty. Christ died to give us deliverance from that death penalty. He did not die so that we could keep on sinning. In Hebrews 10, 28, we're told that if we continue to sin after we have come to a knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice. And so anyway, you and I, as those that have this hope in us of eternal life, the Bible says that they purify themselves even as he is pure. And this is something we have to do. If God waves a magic wand over those who profess to be his followers, to cleanse them from sin at the last moment when Christ comes, then he has got to do it for everybody. You see what I'm saying? And God is no respecter of persons. So when somebody starts telling you that you don't have to worry about cooperating with God in taking on the character of God and becoming perfect even as he is perfect, they're lying to you. And I don't care where they come from, what position they hold. They are lying to you. They're the servants of Satan. And they are trying to get you to be found wanting when Jesus comes. Now, there's a lot of people that tell us there has to be a third temple. And I'm sure some of you are asked this question. The Bible has an answer to any question that can come up about these things. And so if somebody asks you about a third temple, refer them to the first chapter of Ezra. Ezra, the first chapter. It says there that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah the prophet might be fulfilled. God moved upon Cyrus. And he issued a proclamation and put it also in writing that the Jews should return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. That says that the prophecy, the temple prophecy of Jeremiah has been fulfilled. There's another prophecy and that's in Ezekiel, the temple prophecy. If you want to read something beautiful, Read the description of the Ezekiel temple. It says that water will come out of the temple and flow down through the Dead Sea area and people will fish and spread their nets down there by En Gedi. Most people miss one little verse there. And all of this is in the 40, start about the 39th chapter and read on through there and you'll learn a lot. But after God gets through describing all of this to Ezekiel through the angel. He makes a statement. He said, if they are sorry for the abominations that they have committed against me, then show them this. 
They were never sorry for their abominations. They just added more abominations. And so they never received the fulfillment of what God would wanted to do for them. And you remember on the Mount of Cursing and the Mount of Blessing, Mount Garrison and Evil. He said, if you will keep my commandments and my statutes, then will you be the head of the nations and the wealth of the Gentiles will flow in unto you. On the other hand, he said, if you refuse to keep my statutes and my commandments, then you will be the tail of the nations and not the head. He said, I will draw out a sword after you and I will scatter you among the nations and you will become a byword and a hissing to the nations round about. And folks, that's what happened to them. You and I are modern Israel. We can suffer the same fate as those people did. We can become self-righteous and condemning of others. And God says this, if you don't love your brother who you have seen, then you do not love God whom you have not seen. We have to be not critical of our fellow human beings, but we have to pray for each and every one of them. If you remember, Job's problems only ended when he prayed for those three men who had been picking on him at a very unhappy time in his life. And so it will be with us, folks. We have to reflect the love of God so that people will see him in us. And Christ says, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to me. Right? Now, God created us male and female, the Bible says. But in the Bible, he uses the name of the species, man. He's not leaving the ladies out there. He's just speaking the, using the term for the species. Folks, God has poured out all of heaven for us in his Son. When Christ's blood went on the mercy seat, when the Son of God gave his life for us, he gave us everything. All we need to do is ask. But we should not ask amiss. We should ask for blessings that we can share with others. And God will bless us. When I was a young man witnessing and uh, that sort of thing was one of the most difficult things that I could attempt to do. I hated that. I'd do almost anything to keep from having to do that because I didn't know what to say to people. But God has changed all of that. He has provided this wonderful stuff that you saw tonight. And everybody wants to see that. Very rarely is there someone that don't want to see it. There are a few people that have listened to the lying lips of others and they don't bother to come see for themselves. And so they miss a great blessing that God has for them. Anytime God is providing a blessing for his people, there will be those who rise up right out of the ranks and tell bald-faced lies to try to assassinate the character of the person that God is using to share these things with people. Dumb enough, if you'll pardon my saying so, to let these people turn us away from looking for ourselves, then we have allowed Satan to steal away the precious gifts of God. And of course, you folks came and saw and have been blessed. God wants us to use these things. One time I was out in Broken Arrow, Arizona, or Oklahoma, yeah. And there was a man in the audience, we'd been talking for a bit, you know, like now, and getting ready to ask some questions or allow you to. 
He stood up and he said, well, Mr. Wyatt, you're wasting our time and yours. We believe all of this. We don't need this stuff you've got. And uh, the pastor had mentioned that there was an individual that would be there that had a little different opinion uh, about some things. And uh, I said, sir, I understand that you're a pediatric neurovascular surgeon. And he says, yes, I am. Well, there's about eight of those around, so that's a pretty spectacular job. And I said, well, sir, when you can go into the hospital and in the name of Jesus heal those children without laying a knife on them, then you come back to me and tell me you don't need this, and I, I may listen. But until that moment, you need it, and I need it. We all need it. Or God wouldn't have given it to us. He dropped his head and he said, I'm sorry. He at least, you know, admitted that he had made a mistake. So folks, none of us are too clever or too much of a Christian to not need what God provides for us. And today when thousands of people <clears throat> are out there telling thousands of different stories to people, We don't want to be just another voice in the crowd telling somebody something when God has provided very convincing evidence that we can show them, right? Now, there's a prophet that said, and I quote, the workers will be surprised at the simple means that God will use to finish his work. There's nothing more simple than show and tell. But there is nothing more effective. And so that's what God is doing here in this last days. He's providing this. And in Jeremiah 16, 19 through 21, it tells us that all of the Gentiles will come, or that the Gentiles will come to him from the ends of the earth and will say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies and vanity and things wherein there is no profit and have made gods unto themselves that are not gods. Can you imagine what it will take to get somebody to admit that their parents have been wrong and they have been wrong? Human beings don't like to admit that. So these are the things that God is going to send around the world so that people can see with their own eyes as well as hear with their own ears the truth and the proof that God's Word is exactly what He claims it is. And, folks, there are a lot of people today on this planet that disregard the Word of God. How many times have we said and heard somebody say, well, the Bible seems to say this, but I believe something else. Well, a lot of those kinds of people looked for these things that you saw today. And where they went, there was nothing to find. But when God got ready to share this stuff, he found some fellow that was just simple enough to read in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy about these locations. And instead of saying, well, I believe it's somewhere else, went to the places described in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy, and you see the results here. <laughs> Revelation 12, 17, And the dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Folks, we should be among that group, and I suspect a lot of those that I'm, you, that I'm talking to today is. There's another thing that I share with folks. Amos 3.7, or 3.6, sorry. I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. 
what God is saying there is that if he changed, if he wasn't a keeper of his word, the first thing he would have done is burn up those stubborn and stiff-necked people back there. That's what he says in plain language. Psalms 89, 34. My covenant will I not break, neither will I alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. So when God has said something and written it in stone, that is not going to change, folks. Regardless of what people say, it's not going to change. Now, there's a lot of folks that say, well, I love the Lord and all of this, but by their actions, they say, he's going to have to accept me like I am. And he won't do that. He can't do that because he is the guardian of the universe. And if he allows people to go to, into heaven, gives them eternal life without they allow him to purify them and cleanse them, we have been in a horrible state. As I've been giving lectures and showing these videos around the country the last few weeks, and will continue to for about two more weeks, I tell people this, and, and I mean every word of it. If everybody that claims to be a Christian went to heaven, I would want to go somewhere else. Because it's a sad state of affairs nowadays among a lot of people that profess to be Christians. Okay, does anybody have a question? The first here. Okay, uh, the holy precinct or the sacred precinct is a term that we apply to the area that was fenced off uh, from the rest of the camp. That's where the tabernacle was. It's the area that people were not allowed to go uh, without being struck through with a spear. Animals weren't allowed to go. The area enclosed by these stone pillars. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm on the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I get email. Uh, I'm on the internet. I noticed there's a good thing in there. Like, I'm really anxious to find out. Do you ever do that? I think find the answer to take it out. Okay. The, the Ark of the Covenant, the status of the Ark of the Covenant. You read the Ark of the Covenant? You couldn't hear it. You can't hear? The question. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Um, what's the update on the Ark of the Covenant? I'm going to fall down here and embarrass myself. <laughs> That's all right. I'll just get over here and stand still. Um, in Ephesians 1.8, I think it is, somewhere in there, it says, in the dispensation of fullness is of times God subdued all things unto himself through Christ Jesus. And then in Matthew, I believe it is, he says, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son. God has everything on a time schedule. Right? And it has not, the time to show that has not come yet. And so uh, we are showing what we have here so that people who the Holy Spirit can impress when they hear that the blood went on the mercy seat, that settles that for them. And like myself, they're content to wait for the rest until God reveals it. However, we do have some more information on that matter. When the first national mark of the beast law <clears throat> is passed, these are man-made laws that are contrary to God's eternal law. When those are passed and made a law, then the tables of stone containing God's law will be put on public display and it will be explained to everyone on this earth 
that we have a choice. We can keep the commandments of God and receive the seal of God in our forehead. Or we can keep the commandments of men and receive the mark of the beast in our forehead. Or we can know better but just go along with these laws until a more convenient time and receive the mark in our hand. Anyway, that will be made very clear at that point in time. So everything is ready as soon as God uh, is ready, as soon as these laws are passed. And folks, many of you have read that God's last message will go with such power and persuasiveness that even the most determined opponents will have to stand back in silence until it's finished. Meanwhile, in the back halls of government, they will be formulating a set of laws contrary to the laws of God, and these will be enforced on the human family. We're also told that at some point before the end comes, all of us will be commanded to bow down and to worship Satan will be come to this earth looking very much like Christ as described in Revelation and will claim to be Christ. You see, he is the ultimate antichrist. Everyone else has just been his puppets. So these are the things that you and I are going to encounter. And folks, God will give us the strength necessary. And in prison, in Saudi Arabia had no real good reason to expect to get out. One day they were going to shoot me. And we were in a place similar to this except it was solid concrete. And the people that were interrogating me were sitting on one end and there was a door over there with bullet holes, uh, dents in the steel door and bullet pock marks in the wall and blood on the floor. They brought me in from over this way and asked me a few questions, one of which was, we can have 10 men or more, and the Israelis only have one, and we can have 10 tanks or more, and they can have just one. But yet they always win. And they said, why do you suppose that is? How would you like to have been there? Ask that question with a couple of guys with AK-47s with the 60 bullet clip. I didn't enjoy it at all, but I remembered that God said, take no thought of what you shall say. And I said a little silent prayer, and the perfect answer came. And that perfect answer was, I don't know why God allows that. 21 mouths fell open and their eyes bugged out. They thought they had me. I thought they had me. See, they were looking for a pretext to kill me. You remember that's what the Jews did. They were trying to come up with some pretext to crucify Christ. Then, after that, after they got through interrogating me, they said, well, you can go back to your cell. So I got up and I looked around for these two guards that went with me everywhere I went to get up and go with me. And they said, no, you can go back by yourself. So I started out the door I had come in through. And they said, no, uh, you go out that door over there. Well, there were the bullet marks in the blood. I didn't uh, have a whole lot of hope. So I just said a prayer, Lord, please protect my children, and if this is the only way we can be saved, then just help us endure it. And I started walking for the door. <clears throat> the guys pulled back the levers on their weapons, and uh, somebody shouted, Stop, in Hebrew, in Israeli. Well, the normal reflex is if anybody yells anything at you in that kind of a situation, you stop, you know, to see what they want, even though you don't understand the language. 
I got the impression to just keep walking. And so I did. They yelled all kinds of Israeli stuff at me. I just kept walking and I only stopped when they said it in English. And so they sent the two guards out about the middle of the floor and took me back to my cell. And anyway, God can preserve us in any kind of situation. We were going to work on the Tower of Babel back in 1991. <clears throat> and we were a little late getting into the town where we were going to spend the night. Kurdish terrorists blocked the road, come swarming up out of the woods with all kinds of weapons, hauled us off up into the mountains for 21 days, and they speak Turkish, and I understand a fair amount of Turkish. I didn't let them know that, but all that time they were saying they were going to take us to Iraq and kill us one at a time and leave us somewhere where our body would be found. And when the uh, publicity died down, then they'd kill another one of us. And the State Department wrote us off. They have undercover people, you know, that keep track of what's going on. And they, they said, you know, they figured we were dead. Well, the God, God provided, the, the God that we serve provided an opportunity to get out of that mess, and we did. But God can sustain us in any situation that we find ourselves in, and he can deliver us from it. One day, they were going to shoot us because the Turkish army had surrounded them and us and demanded that they throw down their weapons and release the... Uh, tourists. They told the Turkish commander, you go away or we'll, we'll kill the tourists now. Well, I've never known of a Turkish military unit backing off from anything. They were in Korea and uh, they, nobody, they didn't back down. They died to a man before they would do that. And I just, you know, here these fellows were lined up in front of us with guns one of them tears running down his face and he was a tough little fellow and he thought he was going to die in the next few minutes and I had no reason to disagree with that I said a little prayer I said Lord please take care of my family and you know save them and uh, forgive me of you know whatever sins there are left in Jesus name and by his blood and a text came to mind be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That, my friend, was not the text I wanted to come to mind. <laughs> There's another one that I like a whole lot better. And that is, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. But a strange peace came over me, and I was certain that I'd be dead in this matter of seconds. So anyway, don't allow Satan to make you fearful of what's ahead because we serve a God that is very able to deliver us from the fiery furnace or whatever else Satan comes up with and to give us eternal life. Yes? Did you touch the ark? Pardon me? Did you touch the ark? We'll show video. When we bring the tables of stone out and put them on display, I'll show a video of the Ark of the Covenant, the stone tablets being taken out of it, and all of that. And you'll be able to look at the blood analysis through the eyepiece of the, micro, uh, of the microscope. No, he means, did you actually touch it? I, I know exactly what he means, and he's going to have to wait to see the answer. Oh. <laughs> okay. I will say this. If people were killed now as they were back in those days, I'd be dead. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering, uh, the young man that found the ark first, that you said was slender and could make it through the very <laughs> narrow uh, tunnels, I was wondering when he first saw the ark and then he came back in terror, what was it that he saw? Did he mention it to you? Okay. Uh, she is asking about, she's, uh, see, this young man that you're asking about, 
did not see the Ark of the Covenant. He and I had been looking through all these chambers and tunnels and stuff, and when it was the hole was too small to get in, I'd make it big enough for him to get in. Because if there was nothing in there, I didn't want to have to make one, you know, big enough for me. And so anyway, he went in there, and I was fixing to hand him the flashlight so he could shine it around, and I could stick my head in and, and see if it looked interesting. Well, when I started to hand him the flashlight, he came tearing out of there. And if I hadn't jumped aside, he'd have probably dug his way right through me because that young man was terrified. And I believe that it was a terror from God because God didn't want him to know what was there. And it was that that let me know that the Ark of the Covenant was in that chamber or very near to it, and that that was the way to go. And he wouldn't come back in there anymore. So that saved, you know, that, shall we say, he took care of that situation. Okay, yes. Who made the video? And now I'm in the chamber or here? Oh, uh, my wife did the editing. I did some of the filming. And I, I know it doesn't come up to Spielberg's quality, but the subject matter makes up for the difference. <laughs> okay, yes. Can you tell us, are you going to be anywhere on the West Coast in the next two weeks where you're going to be at when? Uh, well, we are actually finishing up on the West Coast. She asked if I was going to be on the West Coast. We may very well come out to uh, uh, Paradise area uh, after we finish the rest of this uh, tour. We're obliged to finish it until about the 2nd of May. So after that, we may very well come to that area. And what we do, we ask the Lord to help us know he, who he wants to see this stuff. We don't call people and ask them to show it to them. Because God knows where everybody is and who will benefit by seeing it. And so anyone that calls us and sets up a date uh, and will pay for a round trip airfare and an inexpensive motel room, take up a love offering, and give me an opportunity to sell the materials to those who want it, uh, then we come and do the program. And it uh, doesn't matter where it is, or, you know, those things. Anybody else here? <clears throat> yes, sir. Have you already discovered the Tables of Heaven? Have I already discovered the Tables of Stone of the Ten Commandments? Yes, sir. Yes, and those will be put on public display right after the Mark of the Beast law is passed. There will be three different laws. One will just tell you that you must keep this law that defies God's law, and uh, people will get around that. Then there will be a law that if you don't submit to that, you can't buy or sell. And of course, all of this is in the book of Revelation. And uh, so after the first one, we'll bring that out so that everybody will have a choice of whether they will serve God or whether they will, you know, serve man. And uh, then I believe that shortly after that, probation will close, Christ will come, and it's over as far as the righteous being under the gun as we are today. Yes. What degree of acceptance or rejection have you found from the biblically uh, oriented archaeology community as a whole in each of these areas of finds? Well, uh, what degree of acceptance or rejection have I experienced from the professional archaeology area or arena? Uh, not a great deal of acceptance. Uh, you know, I don't know if you all saw this or not, but a few years back there was this cute little lady that did a commercial for Haynes Underwear. And she grabbed a hold of them and pulled them this way and that and yanked them around for a bit. And she said, they don't say Haynes until I say 
they say Haynes. Well, a lot of these archaeologists are of the opinion that until somebody with a few PhDs and things like that says this is whatever it is, that it really isn't. But it's my firm belief that most everybody has enough intelligence to recognize when they see ash cities and sulfur balls and chariot parts in the Red Sea and the remains of an ancient boat. Uh, you know, I don't need some archaeologist, a professional archaeologist, to tell me what I saw. Amen. And I don't think you do. And God uh, passes by the wise and the prudent and reveals himself to those who are not. And I'm taking some liberties with that <laughs> quote. But anyway, God wants everyone to know that it's something he's doing, not something some clever person is doing. Thank you. Okay, yes ma'am. In whose possession are the tables of stone? Well, the Israelis think that they have full control of this situation. But I think everybody here knows who it is that has full control of the situation. Amen. It's not me either. It's God. But uh, they will be put on display. And a prophet of God said that would happen. And now it's ready to happen when God's ready. Okay. Anybody else back there? Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. They are not blue. And you'll get to see what color they are. And, and I won't attempt to describe it because there are so many colors and everybody's got a little different opinion. You know what I'm saying? So we'll let you look at that side for yourself. Not blue. Yes. Now, I will say that the original set may have been blue, but God told Moses to make another set of stones like the first. And so that's the set I've seen, and they're not blue. So I must conclude that most likely the first set wasn't either. Yes. just like 
whatever we, you know, compared it to. And so we won't take that chance, folks. Uh, the human mind is too tricky. So some of the, these things are too important for you to, uh, shall we say, misunderstand. And none of you have seen this, so you could not possibly get a mental image of it. You'd get a mental image of something similar. Okay. Sir. somebody that's, you know, thought that, knew that was what had happened all along. He got his army together, his charioteers and, and cavalry, and off he went after them. Now, they had permission to go a three days journey, and they had a cloud that gave them shade by day and warmth by night and light. It says, so they traveled both day and night. On the seventh day, of their flight, they reached the Gulf of Aqaba. And that night, God divided the sea and they went across. Now, if you read in the New Testament, they're told the Passover was a seven-day event during which they ate unleavened bread. So it took them seven days to cross there. Now, in 1963 or seven, Moshe Dayan, marched a battalion of infantry from the beach at Nueva through to Suez City, which is very near ancient Sukkot. They made the march in six days, and they slept every night. So the uh, Israelites were much more motivated than Moshe Dayan's army was, I assure you. So anyway, it was not a logistical problem. Uh, it was very much in the realm of possibility, and it happened. Okay, when I talked about the blood of Jesus on the mercy seat earlier, okay, so some folks wanted to have that cleared up a bit. 
and they have a long ways to drive, they said, so we'll do that before we show the video, right? Now, when the Day of Atonement came in the Jewish blood sacrifice system, it was a day when they got rid of all of the sins that had accumulated in the sanctuary for that whole year. Okay? The rest of the year, people confessed their sins on the head of animals, killed them, or had the priesthood, and figuratively, all of the sins of the people were transferred to the sanctuary. On the Day of Atonement, that was cleansed and started afresh. Actually, no sins were cleansed until Christ's blood touched the mercy seat because the rest was types and shadows. But it was ceremonially clean. Right? So anyway, according to Psalm 77, 13, we're told that thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Now, it's very complicated, folks. All the different sin offerings and wave offerings and, and the many different things that took place. To cut through all of that, every one of those things represented the death of Jesus on our behalf. Right? And there were think offerings. Uh, we were not, those people were not to present themselves before God without. Today, you and I don't have to do that. And I don't know about you, but I do not like to hurt animals. I avoid it. And when I accidentally run into a bird that flies out in front of me or something runs across the road, I feel bad about it. And I always say, Lord, please make a quick end to this mess here on earth so that there will be no more suffering. So, I think if I had lived back in those days, I would have been very careful to avoid sin because I would not have wanted to have had to kill our kid. That's what I think, but I was not there, so I don't know. Anyway, on the day of atonement, the high priest offered a bowl for his own sin and those of his hand, and he sprinkled that blood on mercy so that got rid of his sins. And all of these were transferred into the sanctuary. Now then, the cleansing of the sanctuary is something that only Christ could do, but it was symbolized by the death of the goat that was chosen by Lot. And this animal was killed north of the altar. And you'll find this instruction in Leviticus. I don't remember the text at the moment, but all the animals were killed north of the altar, and Christ was crucified north of the altar, uh, as the type specified. Now then, when this animal was killed, the devil that represented Christ as the sin bearer, it says he was made sin for us who do no sin, that we might be made righteous by him who have no righteousness. And he was made sin, which is represented in the Bible by a goat. Remember, the goats are put on the left hand at the time of the judgment, and the sheep on the right. Well, Christ, when he was on the cross, God hid his face from his son. And Christ, in desperation, cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All his human companions had. And now his father turned his face because he was made sin. So that we could be cleansed from sin and his father could not look upon him while he was a sinner. So anyway, he went through all that for us. But his blood, this uh, blood was carried in and sprinkled on the mercy seat. Now the high priest, while he was performing in the most holy place, 
and bells around the base of his garment, so that as he walked, these bells sounded, and he had a cord tied to his leg. And if these bells quit ringing for any period of time, the people outside knew that he had died, because everything had not been in order when he offered the blood. And they, of course, would then pull him out by this cord. And after he finished all of this, he came out and placed all of the sins of the people on the scapegoat. Some people say, well, now that's real strange because you're making Satan redeem us. Think about it. Christ died for our sins. But every sin that has ever been committed on planet Earth are in heaven. Satan was an accessory to Right? Christ cleanses us from our sins, but he did not cleanse Satan from his responsibility as an accessory and as an instigator. So this is why the scapegoat representing Satan had a part to play in this. All right. Now then, when we found the blood of Jesus on the mercy seat, and once again, for those of you that have maybe come in here late and didn't hear the explanation before, Christ was crucified directly above where God had good men, godly men, hide the Ark of the Covenant in 586 B.C., just before the temple was destroyed by the Babylonian army. See, God knew all of this. He had it planned out from time. And so anyway, the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat was in the thin walled stone box right beneath the crucifixion site. And when I found it, the lid had to the stone box had been broken and slid around. Now, I don't know when that happened. And to put it there were instructed to do that, or what happened at the time of the earthquake, or when. All I know is that that's what happened. So, anyway, when Christ died, and some of you here are medical people, uh, positive of that, I know Jared is. The spleen is under the fifth rib here on the left side, and the Bible, if you look up, the smoke in the fifth rib. You'll see that that was a death blow. Today, if your spleen is ruptured, if you don't get some help, very fast, and it's a big rupture, you know, it's a little leak that you can survive that. If it's really done like a sword or a spear would do it, uh, you're dead. And there's no doubt about that. So anyway, most all of us have a spleen that can hold two to three units of blood. If we get mad or frightened, if our body produces some adrenaline into the blood, then the spleen contracts and injects that extra blood into our circulatory system, supplying extra energy and extra oxygen. And it's called the flight and our fight uh, response in the human body. Well, when a person dies, the spleen becomes flaccid and it fills up with blood because the heart is pumping in that direction. And of course, when, when we die, I have cells in that area and in some of the chambers of the heart. But a great deal of it is in the spleen, like three to four units of blood. Now then, blood is a mixture. It's not a solution. You can dissolve sugar or salt or something similar in water, set it on the shelf, come back years later, it looks the same if you haven't gotten some bacteria in there. But blood, the minute the heart quits pumping it around, it begins to separate out into platelets and serum. Or as the Bible represents it, blood and water. Now, very shortly after that is separated out, the platelets clot. They get to be a larger mass, 
gelatinous mass that would not have passed through a puncture wound for a sphere from a sphere. So all of this had to be timed precisely in order to happen as it did. Now then, when as Christ died, and this is in Matthew 27, verses 50 through 53, it says, When he cried again, he died. The veil of the temple was torn in half from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were rent, the graves were opened, and many of the saints that were in that were asleep arose. When he arose, they arose, and went into the city and were seen of men. They were seen of men. Now then, when the rocks were rent, an earthquake crack came right down the wall of that part, down past the left side of the crossbow and into the chamber where the Ark of the Covenant had been hidden 600 years before. And when the centurion, by order of Pilate, made sure that Christ was dead before he turned the body over to Joseph, the upper burial, he plunged the spear into Christ's clean to make sure he was dead. And when he withdrew the point of the spear, the blood and water gushed out down through that crack onto the mercy seat. Now, if things were not accepted of God, when the high priest sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, he was struck dead. In fact, I'm not sure that he got so far as to sprinkle before he got dead. I was never there. But if Christ's sacrifice had not been perfect and accepted of God, he would not have come forth from the tomb. He would have stayed dead like the high priest that had been, because he is our high priest. All right. For those of you that are familiar with the spirit of prophecy, and some of you are, she made a statement about when he ascended to heaven. It said he had taken the blood in his hands, sprinkled it on the mercy seat and on his garments, and had blessed the people. Also, if his sacrifice had not been acceptable to God, there would have been none of the saints that were asleep come out. That time. So this proves that that Christ did it. It was perfect and was accepted of God. So we can in confidence go to the Father in the name and blood of Jesus and ask for forgiveness and cleansing and to be made like Him so that when we meet Him face to face, we won't be struck dead for the rightness of His coming. Now, when we found this blood, on the mercy seat, I have been strongly impressed to be very thorough and careful about documenting things. The blood of Christ on the mercy seat above everything else had to be done perfectly. Somebody could come along and find fault with reason. Some people find fault where there is no fault or no reason those you can't help, right? But anyway, we took a sample of that blood. Uh, all I had at hand to do this with was a full tap from a Coca-Cola can and a plastic uh, film cartridge. Right? That seems undignified and certainly, uh, you know, unworthy. But folks, what would have been worthy to receive? blood of Jesus. Upon analysis, it was found that in this blood there was 24 chromosomes. All of us have 46. We get 23 from our mother, we get 23 from our father. The mother produces the X sex determinant factor. She cannot produce the Y. But the father is the one that decides or determines the sex of the child. And so anyway, if he produces the YX, and you have an X from the mother and an X from the father, and it's a female child, if the father 
box of wine, then it's a made up chunk. Okay. What we have is a situation where Christ received 23 chromosomes from his mother. He received one Y sex determinant factor from some source other than the human male. And I am positive that this came from his heavenly father. Okay. Amen. So this will be shown to the world when we can show the tables of stone and the power of the Holy Spirit we were told by Mrs. E.G. White. And by the way, folks, if you wonder how I found all of this stuff, with the exception of the Ark of the Covenant, I found every one of these places by putting the description of the Bible game of their location together with the description that Mrs. E.G. White gave all of these places and patriarchs and prophets. And folks, if you don't know about it, her writings, Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveal his secrets through his servant, the prophet. Christ did not say, don't believe any prophets that time, don't. He didn't say that. He said, beware of false prophets. And Paul said, quench not the spirit, despise not the prophesying, but prove all things fast that which is good. If we have reached the conclusion that God will allow this world to end and us to go through the closing events without giving us some additional helpful information before these things happen, then we are naive about the way God works. Right? So anyway, if you want to know what we are about to experience with the great controversy written by E.G. White media. If you want to see how I found these places and how closely they match her description with patriarchs and prophets. Now then, Satan has started a massive line to muddy the water about these things that God is showing us, right? But God will cut right through all of that. And as his wife says this, that he will draw back to that curtain and the blindness and all of that. And every man, woman, and child will see the truth and recognize the truth. And then what they decide to do about that truth will determine their eternal destiny. There's not a one of you here that will not see God's truth. And it's up to you whether you keep it, whether you love it, and go to the Father of man and love the Son and ask that he help us become like him, or whether you reject it and say, well, I don't believe it or whatever, when you know it. See, lying lips are an abomination to God. Have you ever tried to have any kind of relationship with a liar? You just can't do it. There's no way you can do it. And the same is true with God. He cannot deal with liars unless we're willing to get over it. Then he will help us get over it. So anyway, you and I are living the last moments of Earth's history, folks. If we are physically unable or emotionally unable, pass through the events ahead, God will allow us to sleep through these final days. He says, come enter me into my secret chamber, and until the tempest is over the past. Those of you that are able to do this, are God, with God's help, are able to do it, there's a work for you and a work for me to do. I'm a nurse and master. Folks, I make a good living at that, and I like to play golf. I'm not at work earning that money, and I'm not playing golf because God answered my prayer, and I said, Lord, please put a burden for souls upon me that will compel me to work for you and to do what you want done. Amen. Yeah. 
when I ask God to help me to be a son of you to him and to his children on this earth and his son died for it. I was impressed with that Noah's Ark. I've seen a picture of it in Life magazine and read the main artwork and his book on it. And I had done enough research on the aerial photography and all of this that I figured that was Noah's Ark. But I had to go out and take some samples and you know, go through the proof. But that was my highest ambition. I had no inclination that I'd be doing anything besides this. Within one year, I knew where Noah's Ark was. I knew where the Red Sea crossing was. I knew where the real Mount Sinai was. I knew how they built the, they built the pyramids. And I knew where the Ark of the Covenant was. I've been in a state of shock ever since. <laughs> Man. So anyway, we're living in special times and we have special things of God to show people. And keep in mind, folks, that everybody is not going to come to the Lord and be saved. You know, say you see that the Say so they see him, he can deceive us at will, but there are still those among us who think they are so clever, too clever to listen to God. Those folks, there's nothing you can do for them, and since God doesn't force himself upon any of us, there's nothing he can do for them. Okay. Uh, I will answer the question of the gentleman there in the back. Quite often I get asked what was the most precious moment of all in my work on these things that you've seen here. I was in North Carolina one afternoon or evening and the people had just seen the video and they were asking questions and somebody asked, do you camp out when you are working on these projects? And I said, no, I was in the Army, and I got all of the camping out I wanted, and I have no intention of ever doing that again. I said, we stay at a real cheap hotel north of the Damascus Gate on Novelist Road. It's called the Jerusalem Hotel. And then a little later, somebody asked, well, when are you going back? And I said, about the middle of September. Well, we got everything together, and my helpers that I knew I could trust, and off we went. When we walked up to the Jerusalem Hotel, there on the front steps sat a doctor that had been in the audience in Hendersonville, North Carolina, uninvited, unwanted, and I realized that I had spent all of this money to get over there to work on this, and I couldn't because this man could not be trusted. Otherwise, he would have at least asked before he showed up. Now then, I'm very sensitive to make sure that God is with me in everything I do. These things are too important, folks, for somebody to try to use their own smarts or cleverness, which we don't possess to begin with on deciding what to do and when to do with these things. And so I reached a conclusion that God couldn't use me anymore, that one of my mistakes or whatever had been too much, and that I was no longer, uh, you know, in his uh, favor, and that he wasn't guiding me anymore, or this fellow wouldn't have shown up like that. So I just said a prayer, Lord, I'm sorry. I knew to begin with that I was not worthy to do these things. I thank you for allowing me to do this much. And if I can be of any help to the next person, I'll be glad to do it. Well, I have never been more depressed in my life. And I've been in some pretty depressing situations. Saw the Ark of the Covenant, the blood on the mercy seat, and all of that, and then I was no longer useful to God.
I couldn't continue. We decided to clean out the garden tomb of a bunch of trash and stuff that had accumulated over the years. And if you want to see where Christ was buried, go look in the garden tomb, because that's where. And the crucifixion site is approximately 80 feet from the garden tomb. I won't tell you any more on that until we can show it to you on video. But anyway, I had a fan that was kind of cooling us off a little bit because it was extremely hot and the fan died. And so, you know, misery on top of misery. Well, the doctor had been helping and when the fan died, he got his lunch and he scooted back up under some shrubbery off to my right and uh, in the shade and was eating his lunch. And I was sitting flat on the ground trying to fix this uh, fan. And I had nothing to live for, people. Have you ever been in that situation? Anyway, I heard this voice say, God bless you and what you're doing here. Well, the owner of that voice knew everything that I was doing. And I could tell by the way he said that. And I was shocked because there was not supposed to be anybody there that knew that. And I looked up. And there stood Jesus. I wasn't having a dream or a vision because afterwards the doctor piped up and said, Ron, do you suppose we've been talking with an angel? He looked exactly like Mrs. E. G. White described him. Tall, dark hair, dark beard, dark brown eyes, rather light complected for those, you know, for dark hair and dark eyes. And the kindest expression I've ever seen in my life. And I, I knew it was Jesus. But I'm a researcher. And I thought, well, I'll ask a few questions and make sure. So I said, sir, do you live around here? And he said, no. See, the outfit that he was wearing was uh, kind of similar to what Arabs still wear today. Not exactly, because his garments were hand-woven not machine woven like stuff today. And anyway, he said, no. And then I said, are you a tourist? And he said, no. Well, I didn't have anything else I could ask. So I just sat there and looked at him. And he said, I'm on my way from South Africa to the New Jerusalem. Do you remember Jacob's dream? He was a little ways north of Jerusalem and he saw the stairs and the angels ascending and descending. And he said, this is none but the gate of heaven. Christ on his way from South Africa to the new Jerusalem. The prophet says that that is the gateway to heaven. Now then, I just sat there because I didn't know what to say. I was dumbfounded. I'm not even sure I was breathing by then. He looked at me again with that kind expression and said, God bless you in what you're doing here. That post was the most precious precious moment of all of this and the most precious moment of my entire life. I hope that an even more precious moment will come. For all of us, when we can look into that wonderful place, 
and hearing him say, Come, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the kingdom of thy Lord. God has done everything divinely possible to save us, folks. Please don't allow Satan to steal this from you. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you that you love us. We don't know why you do, but we appreciate it. We ask that you'll please bless everybody here this evening. It's only you are wise, powerful, and caring enough to do. Make of us faithful, diligent, humble, loyal, and truthful servants. Help us to lift up Jesus, that others will be drawn to him and be saved. And please don't allow anyone to be lost, that you can use us in any way to help them come to you and be saved. In Jesus' name and by his precious blood, I pray.